Hi, it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to be reading a little excerpt from my new novel, which is still in progress. It's not finished yet, I'm about halfway through it. It's about a boy's obsession with religion. It's a boy's desire to become a monk. And at the same time, it is strangely about the boy's relationship, budding romantic relationship with another boy. So this is a novel where religion comes alive in an erotic way. Those of you who've read my last novel, The Firebird, know that the theme of the innocence and the corruption of innocence has been of abiding interest to me. And in some sense, this novel continues the same theme of The Firebird, but with a very different situation where religion and sexuality come together in a kind of in a strange way. So I'll just read a brief excerpt. This excerpt has been recently published in the magazine Scroll. So if you'd like to follow it up, you can read it there. But I'll just go ahead and give you a sense of it. The following Saturday brought the excitement of a cricket match. India was playing Pakistan in Peshawar. But even that excitement paled next to that of watching it in the common room of Love Hall. It was a breathtaking kind of picnic. All 80 of us packed on the floor of the room, on the thick, ribbed carpet like the prayer hall. The door was closed and weak sunlight showed through the glass pane of the windows and there was only the flickering light of the TV set perched on the table front. It was like a dark festival given to us unasked and we gasped with excitement. We wanted to shout and scream but Narin Swami sat on a chair at the back. It was hard to say if Narin Swami liked cricket. Or at least he liked it the way he liked Karam. But it was hard to say anything about Narin Swami. He rarely spoke during math screenings, only once in a while to make a forecast whether a bat batsman would stay or get out. And he was always right, so that it scared us a bit. His stare felt raw on our backs and we kept our voices to a whisper. TV screenings in the common room made me very nervous. In an exciting way, but still, my heart beat so loudly that it hurt. In the darkness, the common room became a strange place. You couldn't see much. It was a bit like a movie theatre. A movie theatre that was also something of a prayer hall, with a man in saffron at the back. I knew nothing about this till I saw the terrible thing. I forgot what we were watching. Perhaps the Sunday morning Mahabharat on TV or perhaps another cricket match. It was dark and everybody was fixated on the screen. You always did, even if you didn't care for what was on it, because TV in the hostel common room always felt like a miracle. A miracle that had now become ours, but still kind of unreal. I looked to my right only when I felt bodies shifting next to me. Shunandan sat next to me, a good-looking, pale-complexioned boy with steel frame glasses from the class a year senior to me. Behind him was Krish Malik, a math whiz from our class, a boy with curly hair and a thin, bony body. Krish's arms were wrapped around Shunanton's waist, as if he was hugging the lower half of his body. The hands came full circle in front and knotted around his lower abdomen. Shunandan was trapped in a chain. But he didn't seem to notice. He cheered the players along and soar at the rivals. Oh yes, it was a cricket match too, but his body could not leave the chain and it didn't look like he cared. Did he care or did he not? How could he not? Krish's arms were snakes around his waist and knotted under his stomach. He was a senior too, though a boy of small medium build. And how did you caress a senior boy like that? Was Krish a kind of a snake? There was something not quite right about him too, even though he was good in studies and all that. Everything about him was angular and plus he was the hairiest boy in the ashram. His skin was so rich with curly hair that sometimes you couldn't see the skin at all. What did his bony fingers really want to do? That was our slice of heaven in the ashram. The blue fl flannels on the screen and the madness of cheering spectators on the stands, all in our common room surrounded by boys who cheered through whispers. The crowd maddened us. 
for the match was happening in Peshawar and the crowd wanted to drown the Indian batsmen in their fierce attack chant. We wanted to smash the TV screen sometimes, claw at the brute Pakistanis who waved massive green crescent flags like weapons at our brave batsmen who fought their killer bowlers. Cut up their dicks, the bastards. Kashyap hissed at the TV. Dick slit already, Shomindha Road, bloody mullahs. Firecrackers going on at Mullapara. Someone whispered, they cheer whenever Pakistani bowlers get a wicket. Which made things more fun. A rival team close by, a poor Muslim village outside the ashram. You could see the thatched huts from the rooms of the C block. And if you're willing to stare all day, muddy looking women bathing. The villagers hated the ashram and they wanted Pakistan to rub the nose of the Indian team in the, in the dirt. We were on. Slid dicks. Shomendha rode again. Shomen! Narendra Swami's voice struck him like an arrow. Dhar crumpled up like a withered flower. He looked big and burly and already had hairy temples and upper lips. That was because he had failed a couple of classes before he ended up in ours. It was easy to strike him as under the loud bully body there was always shame, the shame of hairy whiskers and upper lips in class 7 and the reminder that you are a big ass boy among children. But Narin Swami never had to say much. Silence thickened in the common room, the TV buzzing alone. The flag waving Pakistani crowd was gone, vanished into the television, far away in Peshawar. We were in a large dark room with a man in saffron at the back. I glanced to my left. Kajol sat, expressionless, staring at the TV. The voice never touched him. His handwriting was perfect and he had high scores in every subject and in room cleaning as you never found a balled up sock under his bed. Was he really watching the match or just looking at the TV because we were all supposed to do so? To watch the Pakistani leg spinner Abdul Qadir was to die laughing. But to face him on the pitch we all knew was to face death. Balls pitched at perfect length and spinning up to a foot to knock the balls off the stumps. A deadly googly where the ball struck the direction opposite to where it was supposed to go. He danced like a cripple trying to bre break a leg once and it was pain painful to watch that you could do such things to your body. But we had stopped laughing as the ball that came out of the dance was an arrow of death for any batsman in the world. The silence sharpened. Watching Kadir was a bizarre kind of delight. He began his dance to the wicket and the whole room leaned forward. My weight rested on palms played on the carpet on either side, ready to pounce. The ball fell on the perfect length before the leg stump and the batsman tried to drive it towards long on. The ball caught the edge of the bat and shot at the off stump like the flickering tongue of a snake. The harami at the slip caught the ball and the Pakistani team howled like a pack of wolves. A gasp went up in the dark room and I clenched my finger to feel Kajol's palm in mine. It was a soft and small palm, almost like a baby's, as quiet as his face. The anxiety was an infection and you had to share it. A curly-haired 15-year-old boy had appeared to face the guile of Abdul Qadir. His name was Sachin Tendulkar and he had raked up massive runs in domestic tournaments. But he was just a boy, and the slimy Kadir would slaughter him easily. Our hearts cried for him. I had not let go of Kajol's hand. It was beginning to feel strange, as the moment couldn't last forever. The moment when you slapped your neighbor's thigh or clenched their palm in excitement. But I held his hand and sensed the moisture in them. The moisture coating his bo bony knuckles. Or was it the moisture from my skin? He was a boy really, Sachin Tendulkar. A boy with a wild mane of curly hair who could perhaps play in our senior school's team. It was absurd and delightful to see him in the massive cricket gear, the pad and the helmet and the heavy bat, among these real and famous cricketers. We were just happy that Walker Yunus, the deadly paceman, was not there to strike blood with his deadly bouncers. He would come back soon, but happily the trickster Kadir would send the boy back to the safety of the pavilions long before that. I heard mutterings next to me. Kashyap had closed his eyes and was saying something under his breath. It was some kind of a prayer. It was odd to see Kashyap pray, as if he were ill and had no, and had no real breath. 
and had, and had no real idea of what he was doing. I unfold each of Kajol's fingers slowly inside my palm, like I was playing a secret game of numbers with his digits. He had smooth, well-trimmed nails. I ran my fingers over them and imagined his tiny nail cutter tucked away carefully under his desk where everything was arranged with the precision of a library catalogue. I knew he never trimmed his nails on a day he was not supposed to. Like a Thursday or the day of the week he was born, just as his mother had told him, but had set aside two days in the week when he clipped them after his bath, when they were the softest. My heart beat wildly. Sachin Tendulkar took guard to face Abdul Qadir. I caressed Kajol's fingers, feeling the spot behind his knuckles where the skin wrinkled, the spot below it where tiny hairs had sprouted. So tiny and so little, it was, he was almost hairless. Kadir did his fatal dance. The ball pitched and spun madly. We wanted to close our eyes and not see the hollow sight of the balls flying off the stumps. Swiftly, the curly-haired boy changed into a battle stallion and lifted it over mid-wicket, a sixer. We gasped and almost forgot to cheer. And then we cheered, a wisp of sorrow in our voices. A spirited boy. He will kick before they kill him. Soon. I squeezed Kajol's hand. It was mine to play with. It did not question my claim on it, doing whatever I wanted to do with it. I could not look at Kajol, but he knew he stared at the TV. Did he resent having to watch cricket? He would be at peace working on his algebra. The rowdiness of the Pakistani spectators and the rowdiness of Shomen Dhar was not to his taste. The camera focused on Abdul Qadir, returning to his dancing run-up. A smile danced on his lips, a cheerful snake. He would now kill the boy, split his stumps wide open. The ball pitched right at the middle stump and treacherously spun in the wrong direction. A googly that would sting the leg stump. Smoothly, the boy pulled the ball over long leg, out of the field and out of the world. Who was this Sachin Tendulkar? Who was this boy, really? Kajol squeezed my hand quickly. My heart leaped. I glanced at him through the corner of my eye. He looked straight at the TV. Where did he have his heart? In Peshawar or with algebra back in his room, elsewhere. And then Sachin Telunka sent Kadir flying outside the stadium for a third time. The spectators were quiet in sudden mourning. Our chests hurt with pride and were about to explode. The firecrackers had died out there in Mullapara. Kadir was smiling. The bastard was game. Everything felt right. I wanted to bring Kajol's delicate hand to my mouth, suck his soft baby fingers one by one. There was an ache in my groin. Everything was taught. Take that, you split dicks! Shomen Dhar howled. Turn off the TV. Narin Swami's voice struck like a slap across the room. I pulled my hand away from Kajol's. Before you knew it, Rajo Shikho stood out on the front row and turned off the television. He loved to follow the most obnoxious orders of the Swami. He hated to see us happy. The boy with the magic hand was gone. Thank you.